How you doing, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer, and for the next two hours, we are going to be talking about Gordon Soley. Gordon Soley was probably the most legendary professional wrestling announcer uh, that has ever lived. And he uh, passed away on Friday um, at the age of, officially on Friday at the age of 71, uh, due to cancer. Uh, we did not have a show on Friday, so this is our first chance to talk about that. We have Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly with us. We are going to have numerous guests over the next two hours, and um, I just will say uh, before they come on that these are the greatest wrestlers from the 70s and the early 80s. Uh, they're going to be on this show today. So uh, for those of you, uh, it's probably a good show to uh, get the tape recorders out for. Brian, how was your weekend? Yeah, it was all right. Yeah. Brian, what... what um, what type of memories? I know Gordon Soley's prime as an as an announcer came uh, probably uh, long before you were a wrestling fan, but obviously uh, you watched him announce many many shows, and I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts about this. I just mean, well, I mean, looking back now, I mean, I was reading a bunch of things on the, uh, you know, there's various internet sites that have a lot of things. I think One Wrestling had a whole bunch of uh, tributes by by various different people, including uh, they had links to comments by Tony Schiavone. And Jim Ross. I mean, nowadays you hear Jim Ross for the WWF, and in WCW you think of Tony Schiavone and some other guys. And I mean, just reading both of those, you know, Gordon Soley was the guy that they looked up to. That he was he was he was so influential to them and to so many announcers today. And I mean, just reading what these guys had to say about him. I mean, they put him on such a pedestal, and even now it's like they realize that they will never be able to, uh, I guess, achieve what he achieved in wrestling as far as. You know, making the matches seem like genuine athletic contests, uh, putting over the holes, putting over the wrestlers, calling the, um, you know, there used to be squash matches on TV all the time. I mean, when I grew up, it was always squash matches. And he had a way of making every single wrestler seem like he had a chance of beating the big star, even though, you know, the guy never really had a chance. But, I mean, Gordon Soley was just, uh, he was the man. He was definitely in his day the man, and we also have another man who in his day was the man from uh, Ocala, Florida. How are you doing today? Oh, great, Dave. Thank you, too. Uh, this is uh, Dory Funk, Jr., who was a uh, world champion for four years from 1969 to 1973, one of the greatest stars of the 70s, late 60s, 70s, 80s, um, all over the world. And, um, of course, uh, he probably had uh, I, I, maybe more of your matches commentated by Gordon Soley than any other announcer, I would think. Uh, yeah, I would think so. I used to spend uh, usually one week uh, out of every five in the Florida Territory. And uh, Gordon did all of our television interviews and our re uh, commentated our wrestling matches. Uh, he did a great job. Gordon uh, knew how to get the wrestlers over. And uh, he knew how to get across a very important thing to the wrestling business, credibility. And uh, even in modern-day wrestling, uh, Gordon... If he were here right now, uh, would be making sure that uh, the wrestlers and and were were recognized for their credibility and their athletic ability and athleticism. You know, one of the things about Gordon Soley, and this is for a lot of newer fans, um, he you know he's a very educated man. He spoke, you know, I mean, I will tell you that my you know when I was thinking about. Uh, you know the influence Gordon Soley had even on myself. I mean, as a as a kid listening to, I, you know, we didn't have videotapes in those days, and Gordon Soley announced Florida and Georgia, so I would get audio tapes of the Florida shows, and I mean it helped. I mean it, it helped so much in vocabulary. Um, you know, just uh, I would hear these words on wrestling, and he would put them into context where you knew what where you knew exactly what the word meant. It's a little phone somewhere. Uh, Dory, can you hear me? Oh, anyway, Dory's I think switching phones. Um, but anyway, um, but I, I just wanted to make mention of uh, just you know things like that, and um, I'm sure there are like many Hello? wrestling men. Dory, is Dory there? Oh, we don't have Dory right at this moment. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to uh, make uh, make a, a quick mention of that. Uh, we seem to be having technical difficulties. Uh, Brian. Um, Real quick, I guess, before, until we get Dory back, um, you want to make a uh, quick mention of uh, some of the stuff. Did, what, what's going to be on? Um, what's going to be on Nitro tonight? Hello. Uh, we are having phone line difficulties with everybody. Uh, what a way to start. Um, but uh, hey, Dory, Dory, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dave. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, we were just talking about, um, I was talking about, 
that, that Gordon Soley had a tremendous vocabulary, and uh, yet, I mean, I, I, I don't think that anyone ever sensed that he was talking over the head, because of the way he used it, he wasn't like he was talking over the heads of anyone or talking down to anyone either. No, I, I don't think so. Gordon was, uh, Gordon made sense to a lot of people. He made sense to, uh, to the wrestling business. Uh, he helped us a tremendous amount in uh, getting points across to the people, making sure that the wrestlers were recognized for their accomplishments in the wrestling business, and in many cases outside of the wrestling business. Uh, Gordon made sure that it was known if a wrestler graduated from a certain university or if he had uh, other accomplishments and fields outside the wrestling business. Uh, Gordon did a real background check on everybody that that he uh, covered and did a tremendous job. Uh, probably, I would say what would probably have been maybe your career highlight or certainly one of them, your match with Gene Kaniski was uh, Gordon was in, in, in Tampa and uh, Gordon was the announcer. Right. It, it has to be my career highlight. <laughs> that, that match has affected my life even today. So, yeah, that was, that was a career highlight. Uh, Gordon, so we did the commentating on that. that incidentally, that was... Um, uh, originally a 16 millimeter film of which uh, Gordon did the commentating over the top later and it was transferred to videotape. Uh, he was a tremendous guy to work with. He was always interested uh, in, in the wrestlers. We used to go in and uh, like we would do our regular television but we would also come in and do interviews and spend hours doing interviews for each town in the Florida territory. And Gordon was always interested in what each wrestler was about. He, did, he wasn't only there to uh, describe the matches. He wanted uh, deep insight into every wrestler. Another thing that, that he did very well was um, not, only, not only like call the holds and, and uh, get all the important points over, um, but also call the effects of the holds like when you would put like a step over toe hold or, or any of these moves one of the reasons that uh, especially like in Florida and, and Georgia later and, and all the places that he worked these moves got over so effectively is because he would say exactly where the pressure was you know right. he would explain Gordon, why Gordon, what, what Gordon had one uh, cliche that was my favorite and uh, he used it often and was quite humorous uh, somebody would get a hit over the head and Gordon would say wow that rocked his brain in its fluid solution. <laughs> and I, used to, you know, I used to even ask him to do that often you know, for people that would be uh, visiting the sportatorium down there in Tampa. He had a tremendous sense of humor. And uh, I guess a, a good look at his own uh, at, at his own commentary in itself. And uh, he could laugh at himself. He could laugh uh, with other people. He was always fun to be around. Um, I know um, just, uh, I guess in the last couple of weeks, uh, the, a lot of the wrestlers that were there now living in Florida were, were planning a big, it was like a big party for him. Uh, um, that, that the, the one, uh, uh, was, there, was something that... There were several events that we were hopeful that Gordon could attend. Um, one of them, uh, we had talked to Howard Brody. We had hoped that uh, Gordon would be able to come up to the final day of our training camp here which was uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, Gordon's passing, even though everybody knew that uh, he had cancer, uh, came as quite a surprise uh, that it happened when it did. Uh, the other event down here is the return to the, uh, the old sportatorium in Tampa, Florida. And we also had hopes that uh, Gordon would be able to make that event. And uh, News of Gordon's death came as, as as a surprise to me, and I think probably to everybody who was planning some kind of uh, event to try to uh, to try to play, give Gordon happiness before, as we all know, eventually the cancer would catch up to him. Uh, it came as a shocker, and uh, I regret it. It also, I do know that. Uh, some people talked to Gordon the night before he passed away, and he was good, in good spirits at that time. So uh, I hope wherever he is, Gordon is uh, is is a happy man now. Uh, Dory, hold on just a second, because uh, we have actually um, a man whose career 
uh, was uh, in many ways uh, his popularity and everything was was called by Gordon Soley from 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 the beginning to its apex. Uh, and your biggest rival of probably your career, Jack Briscoe, on the line. Jack, how are you doing today? Good, Dave. How are you? It's good to hear Junior's voice. Yeah, yeah it's good uh, to hear you, Jack. I'm thrilled I can hear you. Yeah, I don't think you can handle it, Junior. <laughs> Jack, you know, like uh, you, your, your, uh, the, the, the ascension of your career came in the state of Florida, and uh, Gordon Soley was the announcer. And um, you probably thinking back, oh, you know, much of much of your career success to the way Gordon was able to get over the wrestling aspect of wrestling. Yeah, that is true. I, I, of course, have. everybody knows Gordon was the dean of the uh, commentators and uh, the best there was in the world, and that's, that's very true, Dave. Uh, Gordon had a lot to do with uh, my success. Uh, not only in Florida, but uh, in several parts of the country, as you probably well know that in those days the Florida Championship Wrestling uh, program was very popular all over the United States, and it was uh, syndicated through the Carolinas uh, and New York and uh, and on the West Coast and several places, and Gordon was very instrumental in, in my success. Um, what was what would you say is something that like you would best remember um, Gordon Soley by as far as like you know you had a long career you know not only Florida Georgia but everywhere but uh, during that period where you were chasing Junior for the for the title winning the title uh, that that part of your career. Well, always my uh, best uh, um, remembrance of Gordon was uh, only the fact that all the wrestlers uh, admired Gordon for the way Gordon handled himself and the interviews with the wrestlers. But also, Gordon was always able to maintain a friendship with all the wrestlers. It just wasn't a professional relationship. It was also Gordon was actually friends, and Gordon uh, loved and respected uh, all the wrestlers, well, not only the ones that have spent a lot of time here in Florida, but Gordon uh, uh, genuinely uh, loved the business, and he loved uh, the wrestlers, and... and um, considered himself uh, close friends with, with all the wrestlers. Now, how are, you, how are you doing right now, Jack? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I had some medical problems and, uh, uh, about a year ago, and I'm, I'm getting over them now. I had uh, spinal surgery, and, uh, and uh, it put me down for quite a while, but I'm, uh, fortunately I'm, I'm getting much better. I've still got a couple of little... Um, Problems, but they're going to be taken care of within the next week or so, and and I'm doing fine. And uh, you know, Dory, when we talk about you know your matches with uh, with Jack, I mean, much of the hype, uh, you know, the background hype and everything like that in in Florida and even even nationally, you know, was built on uh, you know Gordon Soley's ability to get over two wrestlers. You know, and 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 you know, by today's standards, uh, no, virtually no gimmick involved, and 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 a style and a style of a match that was, you know, it's it's very different than today's style. It was a style of a match that looked like an athletic contest, and you didn't have to wave your arms and, you know, shoot off bottle rockets or, um, you know, you know, uh, uh, to to get the people into the story because uh, I guess, you know, his announcing educated people to what to look for in in the subtleties of wrestling. He very much did. Uh, Gordon's announcing uh, educated the people to uh, to a wrestling match, and uh, what Jack and, and and myself were doing in the ring, Gordon certainly uh, gave us a, a lot of credibility and, and backed us up 100%. He was a tremendous announcer for the type of match that uh, Jack Briscoe and I were having. And I, I got to say, this is the first time I've been on tele, uh, on radio or television or on the media at the same time as Jack Briscoe, and it is wow. a pleasure, and it, it does bring back some uh, uh, some feelings of uh, the old days in championship wrestling from Florida, Gordon Soley, and uh, uh, I, I got to say, it, the great matches that uh, I enjoyed wrestling with Jack Briscoe. Uh, it was a fun time. Uh, I'm very sorry that uh, Gordon is gone, and he's not here with us anymore. He'll be dearly missed, and he was very much a part of that era. Uh, what, uh, do, what what influences would you say? Cer certainly every, I would say every announcer that announces wrestling today, in, in their own way, whether they're trying to or not, subconsciously imitates aspects of Gordon Soley simply because that's how, that's what they grew up watching. 
as a wrestling announcer, as, as the best wrestling announcer, you know? Right. Um, yeah, certainly. I, you know, I, I know that uh, Jim Ross is a fan of Gordon Soley for sure, and uh, many of the and many of the, many of the other announcers are. I, th I think everybody who watched wrestling during those times was was a fan of Gordon Soley. You know, there are uh, fans out there who can imitate many of the wrestling stars from that era, and there are also fans who can imitate Gordon Soley very well. And he was one of the characters of championship wrestling from Florida that uh, he was loved by the fans and uh, by everybody, and I'm sure everybody's going to miss him. We've got another voice from the from the present as well as the past on the line. How you doing? Hello there. Hey, Dave. Hey, how are you, Rick? This is Rick Good, Flair, <laughs> and he's on with uh, Jack Briscoe and Dory Funk Jr. Rick, what are, what, are, what are your thoughts, you know, reflecting back on uh, Gordon Soley and his influence on your career as a wrestler? Uh, well, guys, just, he was just an impacting guy, you know, and I have, you know, I, I met him probably later later on in my career than both Jack and Dory did, but, uh, uh, you know, he was, a, he was the voice of wrestling when I met him and probably uh, the most respected and uh, most highly thought of announcer in the... Uh, it's your best sport, and just a great guy to be around, not only as a professional, but uh, socially as well. And I got to know him pretty well both ways. What's, uh, do you have any kind of like thoughts, like looking back as far as your career and your your first, I guess your first like national exposure would have been out of Atlanta, and um, you know he was he was the guy there when you you know maybe the first time you showed up on that Atlanta TV early, you know you've been wrestling for several years and were already star in the Carolinas, but you know when they told you, you know, basically you got to get on that that TV for the national name. Yeah, well that's kind of you know I was going to tell that story, but it came up but Harley Race you know actually alluded to that. Uh, when I was in the Carolinas, it said, you know, if you ever have an opportunity, get yourself on that on that program. But I had met Gordon prior to that, because uh, you know, I had gotten involved in some real estate stuff in Florida, and I had been privileged enough to meet Gordon on a social basis, actually, before I ever worked with him. So I went into Florida a little bit prior to a little bit prior to going into Georgia. So. Um, I guess you know the fact that any time you got a chance to work with with uh, uh, a guy like Gordon Soley, it was kind of like working with Gene Oakland today. I mean, you were working with the best, and that you were around the best, and uh, whatever he said about you was as good as gold. And Jack, Jack, what were your you know um, going up? Uh, what were your thoughts as far as? Um you know when uh, when Gordon started going up to Georgia, and you were, um, I guess, you would have been just about winning the title. I guess Dory was actually the champion when he, when Gordon first went up to Georgia. But um, in in that era where uh, the, the the Georgia area, uh, you know, got on the satellite and everything like that, and uh, what, what, what were your thoughts as far as like you know all of a sudden you know the beginnings of of actually what we would call it a national television wrestling? Well, I was very excited, and uh, I have been looking um, forward to that uh, day. Uh, very much so. I, I, I firmly believe that uh, the wrestling needed a national uh, uh, form for it to get very popular, to get as popular as it is today. And I was very excited about uh, uh, Turner's uh, nationwide TV program up there. And I always wanted to, uh, matter of fact, uh, my brother and I had talked to. Uh, Jim Barnett, who owned Georgia Championship Wrestling at the time, and Jerry and I owned a small portion of it ourselves, we wanted to do kind of the same thing that Vince did years later on by going nationwide. We wanted to do it uh, in, in those days because it was very popular in, in uh, the big cities all the way across the United States. And Jerry and I tried to get Jim Barnett to go into some of these big cities where, where uh, TBS was the strongest all across the country and take the Georgia crew and go through there and then see what kind of business we could do. But Jim Barnett thought he was uh, good friends with everybody in the country and he didn't want to hurt anybody by going into their towns. And uh, So uh, Jerry and I, although we tried very hard to get him to do this years ago, that Jim Barnett just refused to do it. But it was great for wrestling, and I think it's what made wrestling what it is today it was the PBS show uh, every Saturday night that went nationwide. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I think I think that anyone who was basically my age that was a wrestling fan, 
remembers, uh, you know, on the West Coast it was at 3, 3.05 p.m. It was 6.05 p.m. It's the actually the time slot that was uh, running until just a couple of weeks ago, actually. Right. Uh, that... Um, it, was, it actually started from the from the early 70s, but by the late 70s, it was up in many many markets. And I remember, you know, wherever I was on Saturday, you know, rushing home because you got I had to be home at 6:05 for the for those uh, you know that opening whatever it is the opening music and uh, the introduction of the show. Right, and you remember correctly, David. If in those years that we had all the big stars, all the best wrestlers, such as uh, Dory Jr. and uh, Harley Race, of course, uh, a little bit later. Uh, uh, Rick Flair, we had all the greatest time of in the, in the whole country was right there in Georgia, on Georgia Championship Wrestling. We could have very easily gone nationwide with the uh, tours of the uh, like they do now with the WWF and the uh, WCW. We could have very easily done that in those days if we did a, if we would have had a leader with enough uh, enough foresight to do it. I guess, I guess in hindsight, when we look back at it, it was something that was it was going to be done. It was just a question of who was the one who well, it would do it first and best. Time, uh, uh, cable TV and the satellites made it all very possible, and it was just a matter of time. And it was a matter of uh, who wanted to do it the first and who uh, who did it the first. And obviously, it was Vance who did it. Rick, you know, looking back at that period, because that that period you were you were in and out of Atlanta all the time. How did uh, that Atlanta exposure? Uh, how would you say that like affected your career as far as like when you went outside the Carolinas? Oh, it was huge. But Dave, uh, am I not? I can't hear what Jack is saying. Am I not plugged into Jack? Oh, you might not be. Okay, he was just talking about um, that actually uh, when when uh, you know he owned a, he owned part of that company yeah. and uh, that, that him and Jerry actually were pushing Jim Barnett to go national you know long before yeah. Vince did because they could they could basically see where the business was going and that the crew yeah. was strong enough that uh, they could have gone into big markets and drawn money you know but Barnett didn't want to step on anyone's toes in those days yeah so no, that's the truth i mean jack and jerry were an intricate part of that uh, organization i didn't know we were going to talk about that kind of stuff or not but and i know that jack and uh, and dory both are really close to gordon uh yeah, to answer your question for me, it was, you know, what, 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 what Harley Race and, uh, you know, guys like Dory and Jack, anybody that I, I met prior to, uh, uh, that time when I first went in, everybody was saying, you know, get on, get on Channel 17. And of course, nobody really, I think, really understood the impact of what it was all about until they went to Columbus, Ohio that first time. You know what I mean? And then, of course, everywhere they went for about five years was sold out. Just, you know, any place west of the Mississippi anyway, or any place east. Of the Mississippi, it was just huge because the penetration then was really just the beginning of what it was all about. But uh, Gordon Soley was just really a very, very huge, intricate part of that because no one could sell the business or sell wrestling hold for hold, or you know, could sell talent that a guy had better than better than uh, Gordon Soley, in my opinion. Somebody, somebody, I think it was Don Curtis actually made this comment, and it was about the early days of Florida wrestling. It was long before any of these guys were even on the scene. Um, actually, Dory's father was was um, on the scene probably then, or maybe shortly before or after. And Cowboy Luttrell was the guy who ran Florida before Eddie Graham. And Cowboy Luttrell uh, used to tell, or, or actually Don Curtis used to tell people that Cowboy Luttrell could bring in almost any klutz, and Gordon would still be able to get him over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, Dave. Yeah, Dory. Yeah, while we're talking about Gordon Soley, I'd like to uh, mention one other person who was involved in Florida Championship Wrestling. Uh, Eddie Graham was the uh, uh, promoter down at, at Florida Championship Wrestling. Uh, Eddie spent hours and hours working with Gordon and uh, laying out programs and what should be done and what should be covered on Florida Championship Wrestling. Gordon uh, made a couple of notes. Gordon Soley uh, accomplished several things. He would get the wrestler over. Uh, he would get who the wrestler was, and, and you would know something about the wrestler. He would get the story over. Why was the match taking place? What was it about? Then he would come back, and Gordon would give credibility to the wrestler, and in his commentary, he would give credibility to the wrestling business. He did this in a way that it was also not not insulting to the wrestling fan in any way. Uh, it's a simple a simple way to do things, but in doing just that, Gordon Soley became one of the most popular wrestling announcers ever in professional wrestling. And I really think even today, many of our commentators could uh, take a look at Gordon's career, watch his tapes, 
and uh, follow those principles in, and they would do a lot better than they're doing now. Um, announcers that try to get themselves over are not actually ever going to be in the ring to uh, draw a house or draw a rating. The important thing is, is the wrestlers, and Gordon worked very hard to uh, get the wrestler's personality over and to make the star the wrestler as opposed to the announcer himself. In doing so, Gordon Foley became one of the great stars himself as, as a premier announcer in professional wrestling. Um, Brian, Brian, is Brian up yet? Yeah, I'm up. Brian, is there anything you want to you want to ask any of these guys, or you know, talk about like uh, you growing up and uh, hearing about Gordon Soley in that period in that period of wrestling? I want to know if there's anybody. Um, do you guys think that there's anybody that could come along that could give wrestling as much credibility as Gordon did, or do you think just the nature of the sport today it just can't happen anymore? Well, I, I believe that you know that Gordon, of course, we all agree that was the greatest, but I really don't see anybody today. That, that could do the type of job that Gordon does simply because the business has changed so much. And it's not necessarily that the guys aren't as talented as Gordon was. It's just that the business is so different. The wrestling is so different. The height is different. And just like Junior said, Gordon had this knack about getting the wrestler over, not only the wrestler and the, his moves, but his personality and the whole persona of a wrestler. And, and, and uh, these days, I think it's just so much hype. I don't think it's possible to have another Gordon Solo. Um, Rick, you know, you you talked to you talked to Gordon just a couple of days ago, actually, and um, you know, what, what going going through and looking back and everything, you know, what what you know, what other kind of thoughts uh, do you have as far as going into Florida? The early, you know, Gordon and Gordon announced uh, the the first arcade when uh, when you wrestled Harley Race, and that was one of the big moments of your career, actually. Oh, I, I know, and he did. Uh... God, he did a number of, of, of huge things in, in terms of helping me establish myself. You know, it's funny, and, uh, you know, I'll, get, <laughs> I'll hear about this, but i got to say this, that this conversation right here should be the main event on Nitro tonight. <laughs> Risco, Flair, and Funk, this is pretty good. Um, and I'm sure, <laughs> and I, I mean, I'm, I'm honored to ask you to talk in the same uh on the same uh, time frame these guys are on, you know, and I, I'm just uh, thrilled. And uh, I haven't had a chance to say hi to Jack. I know he wasn't feeling good. I hope he's feeling a lot better now. I heard that he is. but Thank you, Rick. Thank you very I, much. I, mean, I, I know I talked uh, to Jan when you were in the hospital, man. I'm glad everything worked out okay. Thank you, Rick. I, uh, I, Jan told me you called. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's funny. It's with And Dory, who I, you know, have seen a lot of actually in the last 10 years in comparison to the guys that you, that you don't see over the course of your career when, when they uh, quit becoming active, uh, Dory and I actually communicate and see each other quite a bit. But uh, you know, this is a huge deal. I'm talking on on, a, on, on your radio show tonight, Dave, with uh, uh, Jack Briscoe, 31 and 0, uh, and you know, the, Jack and I with the laugh. I mean, I, I just have a lot of respect for these guys, and of course, Dory Funk Jr. and you know, a guy who uh, just you know who did so much for our business. And you know, and at the same time, um, I, we're sitting here talking about Gordon Soley who was right there and able to uh, be part of these guys' careers and, and, and actually probably help mold a lot of uh, what they represented. And unfortunately today our business isn't represented uh, by guys like Jack Risco and Dory Funk Jr. That's one of the problems that uh, we have all the way down through it. Of course, Gordon can't fault any of the announcers in wrestling today, but Gordon Foley was a special guy because he loved the business and he loved to be part of it, and he loved to be part of it as much uh, during the show, as, as he did afterwards, he loved wrestling and he just loved being part of it. And I, I think both Jack and Dory will agree with me. He was just a, just a consummate, consummate wrestling expert and a guy that loved our business and a great gentleman. That had a, he had so much respect for our business. I think it was just obvious by the way he talked about a guy on TV. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the one of the things is. is uh... You know, when when you went into uh, Florida, Georgia, and you were on that TV, um, you know, you were talked about in the same lines. In fact, you often would, uh, you know, like uh, tie in, you know, other athletes. But you know, even Rick, I remember you used to do interviews like that as well. And and you know, tie in. I mean, that world heavyweight title was presented as as if winning the world heavyweight title was akin to winning the Super, you know, your local team winning the Super Bowl and the chase of that title when the local guy was chasing, and all three of you guys were champions at various times were chasing that thing. It was. Uh, 
you know, I mean, I think one of the reasons that that championship uh, was so successful uh, was because uh, he was able to portray it as, as like the holy grail of wrestling. Hey, Dave, it was the last time I wrestled Jack Briscoe was in Orlando, Florida, and when I walked over, uh, the referee said, Jack told me to tell you to go to the ring first. I was the champion. What does that tell you? I've got to say what a, privilege is it, what a privilege it is to be on the uh, same show with both these guys. I was surprised when uh, I heard Jack was on the other end, and now that Ric Flair is on the other end, it's uh, as he... As he said, it's a privilege to be here with you guys. Oh, and, man. Uh, it was my you know, pleasure. Just, uh, uh, it would be a dream to be able to uh, step in the ring with you guys again. It was a privilege uh, all the times that uh, we were able to do it. Very thankful for that. Uh, in, in regard to Gordon Foley, I, like you said, Rick, I just think he, the key to it was that he loved the business and he loved doing what he was doing. And uh, that always flows through to the wrestling fans, whether it's a wrestler in the ring, heel or babyface. If it flows through that he loves being where he is and is having a good time, uh, that's important. And I, that's the way Gordon Foley was. He loved his business, and uh, he loved doing what he was doing. He loved being the announcer uh, for wrestling and did a tremendous job of it. And I don't... There's not a person in the world that I know of that would uh, that could criticize the way Gordon Foley handled professional wrestling. Well, Gordon Foley would love to be a part of this conversation. Oh uh, man! I'm sure, Gordon is up there right now, smiling down. And yeah. if Gordon had anything to do with this conversation, he'd get the competitive juices flowing between all three of us. We'd all be well, ready to go to the ring. <laughs> well, I think you. I think you'd be really excited to have all three of you guys on 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 one show at the same time. No doubt about it, Dave. <laughs> We also have Steve Beverly, a longtime writer who spent basically, uh, I would say, almost your entire life watching uh, Gordon Soley wrestling from uh, Georgia and from Florida. Uh, yeah. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm overwhelmed being here with these three other gentlemen tonight. Uh, yeah, I, I, the first time I ever saw Gordon, I was seven years old. And uh, that was the first year they did videotape wrestling from Tampa that was distributed all throughout the state of Florida. And we watched the matches from Jacksonville, from South Georgia, where I was from. And there was a, what the the guys have said so far. Gordon was first and foremost a broadcaster, and I think that's what set him apart from so many people. Is that number one, he did know wrestling, and he knew the business. He knew how to tell a story, and he was first and foremost a broadcaster. And there is a great difference with some people who are performers. Uh, and I remember Gordon tell, telling me that he knew Dennis James, who was one of the very first people to ever do professional wrestling on television. And he said when a lot of the wrestlers who had wrestled out in California where Dennis James did his matches or in New York, uh, they would come down to Florida. And they didn't necessarily trust Gordon to start with if they'd never met him before because their exposure had been to Dennis James, who really put the wrestling business on. He'd snap chicken bones in the microphone, and he'd do a lot of other things that... Uh, really angered the wrestlers, and Gordon said he said that it took about two weeks before they recognized that he cared and he was serious about the business and he was going to get it over as a serious broadcaster would. And to me, that is what set him apart. Every kid who followed Gordon Foley's career, uh, you'd go in the backyard and you want to imitate his commentary. I'll do. It. You know, Steve. That's one of the things is, is that like that that a lot of people don't realize is that. Gordon Soley did not imitate, you know, like a lot of the, the announcers today, uh, you know, grew up with the, with the Gordon Soley influence, and and when Gordon Soley came on, that was not the norm to treat wrestling in that way. In fact, I remember if you, if any people, you know, any of you watched like old tapes of 1950s announcing, as compared to what Gordon Soley did in the 60s, it's it's night and day different. Absolutely. Uh and Gordon took it so seriously. He was. Uh, there's been a lot that has been said through the years about Gordon. Gordon being the Walter Cronkite of wrestling, and I think it's very true because Walter played it straight down the middle whenever he called uh, and whenever he was a commentator on on television news on CBS for so many years. With Gordon, Gordon maintained the sanctity of that announce desk. He rarely ever left it, and when he did. You knew there was something that made Joe and Mabel at home say, Hey, look at there, what Gordon's doing. I'll never forget the first time I ever saw him leave the desk 
uh, it was a match, and I'm not sure if Jack was in Florida at this point in time. It was around 1968, and they had a match at the end of television one day where Red Bastine was teamed with Omar Atlas going against uh, Johnny Valentine and the Great Malenko, and Omar got injured and was out of the match, and so the second fall is Red against Johnny Valentine and Malenko by himself, and you can guess the direction it goes. Red pulls the upset with a small package hold, it was at the very end of the show, and Gordon went flying out of the desk into the ring and grabbed Bastine and hugged him, and everybody was going nuts in the place, and Gordon closes the show from the center of the ring. And that was a major, major thing for Gordon to leave that desk because there was a, a sanctity as being a reporter that was really something that I think gave the fans a, a feeling of credibility there, that this guy's going to tell you the truth about what's happening. Hold on just a second, Steve. I want to bring on one. We have another guest who is uh, another wrestler of the caliber of the three that we have on the air. And there's not a whole lot of people in this world that I would say that about, but I would about this guest. How are you doing today? Are we talking to me? We're talking to you. Yeah, you're you're in that you're in that category with Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk Jr., and Ric Flair. Well, I tell you what, I thank you very much for putting me there. Uh, those are guys who helped my career along, and uh, I. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I have never put myself in a category with those guys. Um, I still look to them as mentors of mine who uh, taught me a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount of, about this business. And uh, I think that on my best day, you know, if I got half of it, I was doing good. This has to be Ted DiBiase. Hey, you got that one right. <laughs> I'm having a little trouble. I recognize the golden voice. <laughs> what did he say? Uh, Dory said that that, ha that has to be Ted DiBiase. Oh, it is. <laughs> I said I recognize the golden voice. Ted, you know, what are your early thoughts? You know, you wrestled in Atlanta. You know, Atlanta was just being established. You know, it was a uh, uh, TBS, or, or actually WTCG, I think it still was, probably at that time, was just being established at the Superstation. And you were, at that point in time, a wrestler who'd wrestled in a lot of territories, a lot of, you know, Mid-South and um, Amarillo mainly. I think it would run um, in WWF as well. And this was your, ch you know, you you went to Atlanta basically to become uh, the, the, a national star. Right, right. And uh, I went uh, prompted by many of the people that you just uh, mentioned, you know, saying go to Atlanta, get the television exposure. And of course, uh, you know, the, the one of the one of the things that was floating around it was being rumored. And uh, and and I, I want to bring this up. It's a great opportunity for me to say this is that. Uh, you know, I was told to keep my mouth shut when I got to Atlanta, but that one of the things, one of the possibilities was that I was being groomed for possibly a contender for the NWA world title. When I walked in the door for the first television, uh, I can't remember who it was now that, uh, that came walking up to me, but one of the guys came walking right up to me and said to me, uh, I mean, before I even put my bag down, when are you getting the belt? So the cat had already been out of the bag. You know, like that old saying, telephone, telegraph, and tell a wrestler. Uh, but that's one of the reasons that I uh, thought that I was going. Of course, that never happened. I, I, I've probably gone down in history as the one guy that's put everybody over. And, uh, and uh, I, I prided myself in doing that well. But uh, Gordon Soley, Gordon Soley, in my mind, is a classic. I don't think there's ever been one like him or ever will be another one uh, again like him. Uh, he was the kind of guy uh, on that microphone that could take somebody that was a relative novice, that didn't know what they were doing, that was maybe afraid of the microphone and not very not very good, you know, at getting an interview and, and make them look real good. Uh, he was very good at doing what a great wrestler does in the ring. What were your thoughts as far as an, as far as like uh, having your matches called as 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 compared to and you and you and you had good announcers in some of the other places you had worked previous to Atlanta but did you have a feeling when you went into Atlanta for the first time and and uh, that uh, you know going there one of the highlights was having your matches called by Gordon Soley because certainly at that point he did have the rep for being the man oh definitely uh, definitely Gordon uh, was uh, you know had a reputation and was uh, you know, Gordon was a legend then Gordon was one of those guys in his area of expertise was a legend in his own time uh, everybody you know it's kind of like uh, uh, if you wanted to, if you wanted to learn how to, to do it right uh, go watch Gordon uh, let's see Rick are you still there Rick I'm right here man okay Rick I was just I, I, uh, I, I, you didn't, know. I, I didn't want to walk on him but uh <clears throat> 
you're talking to one of my best friends and a guy that uh, I'm, I'm honored to say uh, just had the compliments he paid to me. And uh, as I'm sure Jack and Dory are, Ted DiBiase is a, uh, a great man and a, and a legendary wrestler in our sport and could still be wrestling uh, if he hadn't had a health problem. Um, Ted, nice talking to you, man. Nice hearing from you. Um, all I can say is that, you know, this, I just will follow up by saying the same thing Ted saying, said, that this Gordon at that time was in a class by himself, and he could take a guy, uh, whether he had status or not, and whether he had a lot of ability or not, and he could make that guy uh, in two or three broadcasts on television. And uh, fortunately for all of us, we all had some ability, and we all had the, uh, the good fortune of being around Gordon in, in, the, in, this, in his heyday. Um, you know, Jack. You know, with with, with you and everything, um, he he took your your natural strengths, which was the the amateur wrestling background and and the ability to, to wrestle inside the ring, and created, you know, basically created a, a character for you as this, um, you know, kind of like wrestling machine, but not, um, but you know, un, you know, sometimes even an, an an underdog, but at the same time, someone who, I mean, it was almost like. Uh, you, in, in your day coming up, it was almost like unthinkable that somebody could beat Jack Briscoe, and I think that was one of the uh, reasons why your program with Dory Funk Jr. was so successful, and, and you were so successful in the Florida area as was Florida champion and, and during that period. Well, I, I think so. I'm, I'm sure of that, Dave. And, uh, and uh, uh, before I get into that, the, one of the best quotes I ever heard was Leroy McGurk, who was the blind promoter from Oklahoma. One of his statements one time after he had heard Gordon Soley, he said, you know, being as blind as I am, Gordon Soley could make me see that wrestling match. That's the type of announcer Gordon was. I thought that was a great quote even back in those years. But, yes, Gordon, he had the ability to mesh my amateur background along with my professional uh, moves. He would mesh the amateur moves along with the professional moves and uh, make it look like a shoot. And uh, uh, was very, very instrumental in, in the, to making uh, making me what I was, and, and of course making the rivalry that was between uh, uh, Junior and myself and, and and Flair also. I'd also like to take this uh, time to say that uh, Ted DiBiase is a man of great class, and I'm glad to call Teddy my friend. It certainly is good to hear his voice. Yeah, it's, it's great to hey, I tell you what, I, I didn't realize that. Uh, when we were uh, called to do this interview that I was going to be on the phone with all of you guys and it's just I mean it's to me it's a it's a moment for me it's uh, a classic Dory and day, Jack man. and Rick I mean uh, I love you guys I always have uh, and in my mind and in my heart you're all part of and I, and I feel like I'm a part of that era of wrestling which is, is uh, it's it's gone guys when we're gone it's gone <laughs> man <laughs> Well, uh, uh, one interesting point. Uh, isn't it strange how the uh, the real people uh, are so much more interesting than any uh, writer could, uh, any storyline a writer c could create? The real stories of these people that are on the telephone with me are much more interesting than uh, any storylines that could be created for them, just their real lives. Well, you know, the thing is, is that is that the the reality people can see is not contrived and there's a lot more you know beneath the surface that i think i think that's one of uh you know one of the strengths of of reality based you know reality based rivalries uh i was i want to go uh, steve do you have anything to add right next we haven't had a chance to go back to you well i i, I think that what all the the gentlemen said and, and uh, i had a chance to meet ted about two years ago when he was here in jackson tennessee and uh i just i think the world of what he's doing for young people all over this country right now and uh it's still they still talk about the uh, crusade you led here ted it, it meant a lot to so many young people but uh Dave, I, I think that one of the things, and I, I was talking to you about this yesterday, I, I think one thing that Gordon was almost a pioneer in, and Lance Russell also did this very did this very well. Gordon had a way of in the days when you were supposed to cheer the the uh, fan favorites and you were supposed to boo the villains. 
Gordon had a style in which he would stand up to the villains and challenge them about what they did in the ring. And I think that's one of the arts that we have lost in wrestling commentary today. And that's not to knock the announcers. Ross still does it, but he does not do a lot of interviews with the wrestlers. Uh, but when they would do interview segments after the matches, Gordon would stand up to the villains and say, we saw what you did there, or it would be something to challenge them. And it, what it would do is two things. Number one, you knew Gordon was still sticking up on the side of the of the favorite, but at the same point in time, that way, I really think, did uh, a lot to draw out a villain's interview technique even more than what we've seen today. And I thought Gordon was a master at doing that. And I think that's an art that is really, really gone because you just don't see that very much anymore. Well, I think Gordon, and you guys will, will probably be able to test this better than me, one of the reasons that he was able to do that was because he had the respect of all the wrestlers. I mean, if Gordon solely said something, the wrestlers aren't going to pull the mic from him in mid-sentence. It just wasn't something that anyone would ever dare doing. Well, that's what I said earlier, Dave, that uh, Gordon, uh, not only uh, he respected the wrestlers, he was friends with all the wrestlers, and all the wrestlers knew that Gordon was a, a good man and a real man and was just trying to do his job, trying to get everybody over, including the heels as well as the baby faces. Brian, is there anything you'd like to bring up right now? I was actually wondering about, um, you know, nowadays, at least in the WWF, most of the announcers are filled in about what's going to happen beforehand. And I know there have been cases in WCW where they don't fill in the announcers to try and get a more realistic reaction. But how exactly did it work with Gordon? Was he a guy that was filled in about what was going on beforehand, or did he just, uh, you know, have to wing it? Dory, you probably might know more about that than. Uh, you know, I mean, could, you, could you repeat that? I was unable to he, hear, Dave. Okay, he was he was uh, asking um, with uh, with Gordon. I mean, like in the WWF, basically, the, you know, they go through and they have the big meetings and they go through all the points and everything like that that need to be made during the broadcast. And in WCW, the the basic thing is, I mean, they do that in WCW, but in a lot of ways, they don't tell the announcers what's going to happen ahead of time because they feel it's a more natural reaction. I mean, how much. Preparation ahead of time. Actually, I could I could answer that in some cases, and Steve probably might even be able to. There were times when when Gordon announced Southeastern Championship Wrestling, where I know he didn't have any preparation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Steve, why don't you tell that story about about um that, that's that's actually a really good story about uh, when Gordon would do because Gordon would would do would fly from Tampa uh, on Saturday mornings and do the Georgia show, and then right after he was done in Georgia, he would fly to Bur was it Birmingham or D or Dothan? Well, to do a live television show. What what happened was in the mid seventies when he began doing the Southeastern Championship show that was still done live at WTVY in Dothan, Alabama. Dothan is a hard place, and I know that some of these guys who may have wrestled in Dothan before that's not an easy place to get to. And so Gordon was going by flight to get from uh, Tampa to Atlanta to do the Saturday matches for TBS that were taped from 10 to noon, and he'd have to do some wrap-ups and wrap-arounds and usually would get out of the studio about 1 o'clock. Well, he had to be in Dothan at 5.30 Central Time to do the live show in Dothan, Alabama. And, and what I thought was interesting is that here's this guy that was the big star nationally of the Superstation as an announcer, although he never saw himself as that. But yet he continued to do the smaller state shows. And one of the things that, that he told me back in uh, 1987, he said there was more than one Saturday that I literally dashed into the studio as the theme music was playing. I had never seen the rundown. I had no idea what was on the lineup, but he said, you just did it because the show was live. And uh, and I was told that he was masterful sometimes at being able to make what for him probably was mincemeat, not knowing who was going to be against who, uh, and making it communicate to the viewers well. But that happened on, on more than one. In fact, he told me once that he got into the studio literally and they were already starting the first match. Wow. Well, we've, got to go to, we've got to go to a commercial Dave, break. Dave, right. Dave, yes. Dave. Yes, Rick. Let me tell you a story. Okay. I, I, I want you to ask that gentleman to talk and who you think made, who he thinks made those runs to Dolphin with Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did a few times. <laughs> yeah. More than one. Hey, I got, I've got my kids and I gotta get off there. I gotta tell a great story. Okay. Um, and this is a Jack Briscoe story, uh, and, uh, a Roddy Piper and a Golden, Gordon Stolby, but I'm sure all these guys have heard it. Um, and what came to mind is thinking about how serious Gordon was. The only guy 
that could ever crack up Gordon on, when he was doing commentary, to my knowledge, was Piper. For that brief period of time, they made Piper the, the co uh, the color guy on on a Georgia Championship Wrestling before he went to New York. Do you guys remember that period of time? Yeah, yeah, eighty eighty one ish. Yeah, he was right. just, and he was phenomenally funny. And Gordon, of course, was so straight and so accomplished. And Piper was a very witty guy. And Bob, Bob Armstrong was the uh, was the big Bay face at that time in Atlanta. So Gordon was saying something about uh, <laughs> the fact that uh, Bob Armstrong was a thoroughbred, and then of course Piper chimed up with something with, with legs like that. You call him a thoroughbred, and <laughs> of course Barnett went, "Oh my God, you've just killed my Bay face!" You know. You know <laughs> The, the Jack Briscoe story, we're in Asheville, and this is a, a great Roddy Piper story, Ash, uh, Jack Briscoe, Gordon, all these type scenes, because I think Gordon had done the show on TV, but I bet Piper a hundred bucks that uh, he couldn't take Jack Jack down if he, if he knew about it, if he didn't know about it. And uh, I mean, if uh, I bet Piper a hundred bucks he couldn't take Jack down in the ring, and, and, and Jack would have no advance notice. So, of course, Piper took it. So, in Asheville, Dory and Jack both remember the building. We're all out watching. And uh, <laughs> Piper, I don't, know, I don't know how Jack did it to this day, but Piper got a hold of one of Jack's legs. And Jack actually hopped around on one leg. <laughs> after, after warming up with 10 jumping jacks, as he always did, hopped around on one leg for about 30 seconds. And as soon as Piper stepped in too close, it was over. <laughs> the bag gave Piper a standing ovation for trying. But anyway, I, I had to tell that story. I got to check my kids in the hotel. I loved uh, talking about Jack Briscoe and Dory Funk Jr. and Ted DiBiase and Gordon Soley was a great guy. But Jack said earlier, he's up, he's up in a, in a better place for him right now. We should all, you know, tonight in our own special way, whether it's have a drink for Gordon or you know say a prayer for him. He was a great guy and uh, a real inspiration to all of us. And I want to say goodbye to these guys and I want to thank you for inviting me on the show, Dave. Uh, anytime I can be on a show with these uh, three guys or four guys or five guys, actually. Uh, it's an honor. Thank you very much, and I, I look forward to talking to all of you. Thanks, Dave. Jack Briscoe had to go, so we're here with uh, Dory Funk Jr., Ted DiBiase, Steve Beverly, and, of course, Brian Alvarez. We're also going to have a couple more guests up between now and the end of the hour. I uh, want to quickly remind everyone that uh, you've got a lineup here. I don't even know where I put it uh, for um, tonight's Raw show. Let me, let me see if I can grab that thing. Uh, Raw is war. Uh, the Dudleys will take on Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle. Kane against the Big Show. Uh, a hardcore tag team match with Steve Blackman and Al Snow against X Pac and Road Dog. A tag team title match with Edge and Christian defending against the Hardy Boys. Wow, it's a couple of protégés of Dory Funk Jr., as a matter of fact, that is at his camp, which we'll talk about in a second. Rikishi against Taz. Eddie Guerrero and China against Perry Saturn and Val Venus. Stevie Richards and his censorship crew will be there. And uh, this is all from the Georgia Dome. Of course, Hunter Hearst Helmsley will be there. And Linda McMahon will be live from the Republican Convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I want to ask... <laughs> God, now that is that is a real weird one. I, I, I can't help but ask Steve Beverly... Uh, Steve, what are your thoughts as far as uh, the WWF um, at the Republican National Convention? Uh, Dwayne Johnson, of course, will be there Wednesday. And this new... I, I, I have to say that I'm not the least bit... I'm, I'm, I am somewhat scared and, per, and I'm perplexed. Is actually the wrong word, but I guess scared in, in, in some ways of uh, this attempt by the World Wrestling Federation to get into the political arena. Yeah, so it is a little, a little bit scary when you stop and think about it, but I, I'm sure this is somewhat of an attempt on the Republicans' part to a degree to try to reach out to younger people because uh, they are considered to be a party in many respects of, of uh, middle-aged to older Americans, and they are trying to reach out to younger voters. Now, will something like this work? I mean, I, I don't think that you're going to have a mass hysteria of young people going to the polls to vote for any party just because a wrestler uh, is there or any celebrity is. I, I just really don't think that influences people's votes today. But I, you got to understand, the conventions now are image. They are really meaningless because the, uh, the presidential nominees were decided long ago. The vice presidential nominees are not decided at the convention anymore. So this is all, I think, an idea just to, to build some image and probably to gain some attention because the conventions are going to be covered mostly by cable. Very little of it will be covered except for the acceptance speeches by the uh, the major broadcast networks, and, and that's really what all this is. Uh, Dory, having been in the business for um, your entire life, 
What's what's your feeling sitting here now and, and seeing you know where where Dwayne Johnson, Rocky's son, has been invited to the Republican National Convention, and you see you know evidence mainstream of professional wrestling, the likes of which you know probably there's, there may never have been at any point in the United States. I mean, you've seen it in Japan at this level, but in the United States, I mean, it's been popular in many different ways, in many different forms, but this is a, certainly, I won't even say the most popular, but it's a very different kind of popularity that wrestling, than wrestling's ever enjoyed in the past. Oh, from the wrestling side of, uh, looking at it from the wrestling side, I think it's great. And uh, I think Dwayne Johnson uh, can certainly uh, handle the Republican National Convention uh, I, I know when he gets the microphone, he's going to do a great job. He just does all the time. And uh, I think it's uh, great for wrestling. It may be even good for uh, the Republican uh, Party. Ted, Ted, you know, what, what's, what's your thoughts? Because I know you have a lot of mixed feelings as it comes to today's product. I'm sure that, like, you know, I'm sure that you respect the guys and what they do, and yet at the same time, you know, you have you have your moral opposition to a lot of the storylines that 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 uh, have taken place in wrestling in the last three four years. Yeah, I, I do. I, I have a major issue with the, with the moral storylines. You know, and and uh, I don't want, and uh, again, I don't want to you know just just lamb based wrestling. Uh, you can pretty much turn on primetime television, and pretty much across the board. Uh, it's it's inundated with with uh, strong strong sexual overtones and uh, just a lot of things that uh, the kids shouldn't be shouldn't be viewing. But just the overall, uh, you know, it, it's it's the it's what the WWF now brags about. This this is what they call the WWF the attitude. You know, uh, it's kind of like you know when you take a guy like Steve Austin, you know, and and and. You know, a great talent, um, and you gave him walk out and stand in the middle of the ring and guzzle down a can of beer, flip everybody the bird, you know, and across his chest is emblazoned Austin 316, which blatantly mocks and laughs at God. You know, whether you're a Christian or not, um, it's a, it's sending a message. Uh, you know, it's like it's Jerry Springer, it's Howard Stern, uh, both of which I think are absolutely ridiculous, and I wouldn't allow my children to watch. Uh, you know, wrestling, uh, realistically, in the, in the past, has always been a morality play. It's always been about the good guys versus the bad guys, where ultimately good conquers evil. It's not that way anymore. It's not that way anymore, and it's very sad that it's not. It's more about shock value. Right. Uh, and, and, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, I'm listening to Ted DiBiase. And I just want to let him know that I've got about uh, 10 to 12 kids that are wrestling currently on top for the WWF. And I only want to promise Ted that I didn't teach any of these kids how to do that stuff. You know, Dory, I learned how to wrestle, and that's all. Yeah, and Dory, you, you, you don't even have to tell me I didn't that. Teach, I didn't teach them all that other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Ted, Ted. Dory, Dory I, I've known you ever since I was a kid, you know, and... Right. and uh, uh, I know. I, I, I don't even have to tell me that. Uh, I know your got style. Story, I think I know I your heart. Uh, I can remember Teddy DiBiase watching his father uh, wrestle in Albuquer Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I am Mike DiBiase. was a great wrestler. He was a great worker. He carried a lot of heat. And the fans were kind of on Ted's father. And Ted was running up and down uh, in front of those fans. Uh, very upset at the fans with tears spouting, spouting out his eyes uh, because those fans were um, getting on his father. Uh, and Ted, uh, he was about 11 years old at the time. But uh, I was with Ted for a long time as he followed the wrestling business. And uh, much like we were talking about uh, Gordon Soling and the credibility he gave to the business, uh, for the part of the time that I was around Ted, he always gave a lot of credibility to the wrestling business. And I'm very proud of what he's done and what he's doing with his life now. But I do want him to know that I didn't teach any of those kids at the WWF to do all those bad things. I only taught them to wrestle. You, you only taught them the good things, right? I only taught them the good things, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, watched, we, watched that, we watched that Raw show, and um, I mean, you know, for, for for wrestling quality, it's uh, I mean we we you know every Monday night there is a, there's a lot of really good wrestling on that Monday night show now you know more than two three years you know well, much more than two three years old. Wrestling bell to bell, yes, I gotta yeah. agree with you, Dave. And See, and that, you know, Dave, like you said, you said it for me, really uh, mixed emotions without a doubt. 
and uh, because oh gosh, you know, there would have been a time. I mean, I grew up in this business. I've loved this business my entire life. You know, I've never I've never been ashamed of it. But I would have to say here of late, you know, it's like gosh, you know, I I, I when when people say, well, weren't you a wrestler? I go, yeah. But I, you know, I'm not, I haven't been in the last few years, and I, I clarify. I have to, I have to clarify when I worked, you know, because I don't, I don't, I don't want to be identified as being part of what I see today. Uh, the, the the sad thing for me is that, just like you just said, there's a lot of great wrestling on television. There's a lot of great young great young talent out there that, that are learned to work that have, that have that have filled it. You know, filled the gaps and filled in uh, some pretty big shoes, but I think they could have the same product. I think they could have the same popularity and not have to go to the extremes that they're going to. Uh, to me, when you say, "Well, we're just giving the public what they want," to me, that's a to me, it's a cop out. I don't I mean, know uh, uh, how to put this any other way, but would you say that the uh, WWF has cleaned up their act in the last six months or so? I would absolutely. I mean, not, and and it may not. Have, it's, it's it's not necessarily uh, as much decision may be made from the top as much as decisions forced by outside forces. But um, certainly, the Thursday SmackDown show is uh, about as tame as. Uh, when you when you call Brian, when you call probably the tamest of all the national shows, uh, easily the ta tamest of all the national shows. As far uh, as it, the major shows, I mean, like probably the weekend shows like Jack are probably pretty tame. But I mean, as far as the you know A shows, SmackDown is definitely the tamest. Yeah, but that's uh, you know it's it's I mean certainly if you compare the angles in the WWF now to what they were, what would you go go back a year, um, a year a year ago, um, it it has it's it's a lot it's a lot cleaner it's a lot you know, I mean, yeah, I mean it, it is less offensive than it was certainly in the period when when Russo was writing and the storyline was a lot more important than the actual in-ring product. I mean, one of the things, so many guys they they brought in so many guys uh, that have developed all you know roughly at the same time your Kurt Angle's Edge and Christian and Hardy Boys and all these guys right before our eyes and at the same time throwing Chris Benoit, De Guerrero, Dean Malenko in right. the mix. All of a sudden you've got you know you've got a roster of workers that's uh, probably equal to any company in in a long long time. I yeah. think that Ted was absolutely right on on one point. And, and, you know, unfortunately, I'm, I'm lambasted by a lot of people as being a major critic of this industry. I've loved wrestling for, for almost, well, let's say I loved it for about 35 years. I, I detest a lot of what I see with it now. I've got two daughters of my own. We do use the off button on our television set, but there's a residual effect. And Ted's right about, you know, where is the responsibility because there is a residual effect that kids get from these programs from friends who don't have parents who exercise control over it. But Ted's right about another thing. It's not just wrestling now. We are seeing this filter into all forms of primetime entertainment. There's no such thing as a family hour anymore unless you go to Nick at Night. You can see it particularly in what has happened this summer with the show Survivor and Big Brother. And both of these shows are on at 7 o'clock at night in the central time zone. And you look at the language, the sexual content, and the extremes of the personalities of these shows. And you can see a lot reflected in what you've seen in professional wrestling over these last couple of years that, uh, in my opinion, has just been terrible. Uh, as far as what it does send a message to young people about. And, uh, and I think Ted's right on the money. It's, wrestling has had a lot of faults that I've been very critical of in the last uh, two to three years. But it's all over primetime television now. That's well, I think the key WWF sec, uh, for WWF currently is their um, bell the bell performance. And there's uh, about 12 to 15 wrestlers that have moved into the WWF it can really perform on a level uh, and athletically even better than uh, uh, athletically and physically even better than, than I did. And uh, I think uh, a lot of those young wrestlers have made a difference, and I think uh, WWF has certainly cleaned up its act a lot. Uh, you know, and you know, it's, uh, what it is now is probably just a reflection about... Uh, 
about about of the quality of uh, television broadcasting in general. Ted, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> okay. and I agree with that, Dorian. You know, one of the things, and one one good point that I think, you know, what I read in what you just said was, you've got a you've got a, a core of guys there now in the WWF that can work. Yeah, you yeah. know, you've got a core of guys there. Uh, <laughs> some of those guys that you ro rolled off are, are like I was and like you were, second generation wrestlers that grew up right. in the business and have a love and appreciation for it. That guys that never grew up in it, you know, for some guys it's just a, a means to an end, but for some of us it's 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 in, it's in your blood, it's in your life, it's been your whole life. That makes a big difference, you know. I, I believe that some of the storyline, storytelling, soap opera stuff that's gotten to the extreme. That's taken it over that edge and 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 towards the filth was done basically because you there for a while you didn't have the talent you didn't have guys that could go out there in yeah. the ring and tell a story they had to tell the story backstage and then just go out in the ring and beat each other up for ten minutes I don't know I think I think part of it I think there's there's some of that and I think there's also uh, you know, a constant struggle for power within an organization and everyone trying to justify that their positions are the most powerful. And when you have, you know, um, I mean, I think that in, in WCW, one of the things we're having right now is that the writer uh, is basically the one in control of the storyline. So he's going to write a show that is, to, is predicated on the writer's writing being the most important part of the show. If a wrestler was writing the storylines, he would, uh, you know, a good wrestler, he would probably try to predicate it on good wrestling. And, you know, I think there's that, that in both organizations, I think there's that struggle from uh, creative side, wrestling side, marketing side, all struggling for who controls the direction of the company, you know, basically for their for their own good. What city did superstar Billy Graham win the WWF Heavyweight Championship from Bruno San Martino in? And I guess that segue will tell us that uh, we have superstar Billy Graham and we also have Howard Brody joining uh, Dory Funk Jr., Ted DiBiase, and Brian Alvarez on the show right now. And I want to uh, welcome uh, superstar and uh, Howard Brody. And uh, for those of you who don't know, let me, let me quick talk about Howard Brody's... Um, Howard Brody was actually the uh, guy behind the syndication of Ring Warriors, which was actually the last broadcasting job that, that Gordon Soley did in professional wrestling. It was tapes for, for the European market of New Japan Pro Wrestling, and Gordon did that through, I believe, it was, was it 1996? Yeah, through, through 96, that's right. Yeah, and uh, Howard, um, Howard was uh, like, um, actually, you know, Gordon Soley pretty much broke you into wrestling, right? Yeah, Gordon and uh, Hiro Matsudo, my two, my two mentors. Um, in, in, in the business and uh, uh, just you know two really great people and uh, unfortunately within the last six months we've lost both no, seven yeah. months, excuse me um, I want to bring, also bring on a superstar Billy Graham, who was one of the biggest attractions in pro wrestling during the 1970s, like like a lot of the wrestlers who've been on the show um, and are and, and Dory and and you know who's on the show right now. Um, and uh, you wrestled a lot in Florida uh, against Dusty Rhodes, I guess would probably been your your main rival, main rivalry and everything like that. And also came in and out uh, when you worked in other territories to Florida for some major shows. And uh, you're very familiar with Gordon Soley. Hey, yeah. You talking to me, superstar? I'm talking to you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, real, real, real close to Gordon. Uh, you know, I was just uh, uh, his voice was like, uh, you know, it was so uh, it was like he had a gift. You know, a natural gift. Uh, 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 the quality of his voice and his delivery was just uh, uh, it was so smooth. It was just. It was like it was an effortless thing for the man to do, and uh, I've got some great uh, uh, some photos of uh, uh, myself and Gordon uh, sitting and uh, sitting at, at his desk with that Florida the Championship Wrestling Florida background, NWA background, with uh, Harley Race on one side on my left, me next to Gordon, with me holding the WWF three WF belt, and uh, Harley holding the NWA belt when we had that big. Uh, Belt against Belt in the Orange Bowl. So I've got some uh, real classic photos, uh, personal photos of Gordon that uh, I consider a treasure. Uh, you know, I, I really do. 
when uh, you were coming in, because uh, you'd actually been in the business for, um, I mean, I couldn't tell you the number, but probably, you know, six, seven years before you ever came to Florida. It wasn't, it was not, you know, what, you know, you would, you would probably heard, and what were your thoughts as far as, um, did you ever get to meet Soli before you came to Florida, or, or and what were your thoughts of going down to Florida? Because he really commanded, tremendous, as we talked about earlier, tremendous respect among the wrestlers and among people in wrestling. Right. Uh, I never did uh, know of or about uh, Gordon until I actually went to work there uh, late 76, like November of 76. I started working in Tampa. And uh, that's when I first uh, met Gordon and uh, and then, uh, you know, in and out uh, with Dusty so many times. And then uh, I guess my, my last time was probably when I worked uh, with Kevin Sullivan down there uh, when Dusty was booking for Carolinas and Kevin Sullivan was, was booking for uh, uh, for Florida, and uh, and that was about the last time. But I have a uh, I have some uh, some nice video tapes uh, that I've uh, held on to with uh, Gordon doing the uh, commentating there uh, with Buddy Colt, and it's just uh, it's just just classic stuff, and I'm, I'm glad uh, I'm glad that I have it. But it really was uh, uh, you know you know Gordon Sully could make. Uh, a wrestler who was a novice sound like he was a pro, you know could be a world champion you know his delivery and and his command of the of the language the english language you know it was just he was just unique he was just uh, exceptional uh dave uh in uh, and i and i've heard a lot of uh uh, uh, leaders, uh you know uh during the time that i worked but uh, i have to say that he was absolutely the the cream you know he just uh, of the crop he was absolutely the, and, and uh, a good friend a nice guy a, a great person a gentleman and uh, I have a great picture of Gordon and I uh, a color photo and my personal photo gallery right now on my website and uh, anyone's well uh, go there that really haven't seen any pictures or maybe your listeners who don't know what Gordon looks like. Uh, there's a nice shot of me uh, and Gordon together that I, I, I would really love to share with a lot of fans who may not have had a chance to see uh, Gordon. So I want to let them know that. Whoa. That was scary. Um, Howard, I wanted to talk. Go back to you for a second. Um, sure. Howard, you know, um, you were very close to Gordon over the last several years and everything. And, and how, um, I mean, I guess you know, since his wife died and, and, and that period, you know, how would you describe you know his you know he he had a tough fight with cancer, especially having going th gone through it with his wife and also with Hiro Matsuda, who was what would in in and out of business partners with Gordon in many ventures. Uh, you know, going back, uh, going back to the championship wrestling from Florida days. I mean, they go back a long, long ways. Right. And uh, how was he feeling in those last couple of months? Well, you know, it, it, it's real interesting. At one point, um, you know, Gordon really thought he had this thing beat. Um, you know, he had he had the initial oper operation to take his voice back, a voice uh, uh, box out. He was speaking with one of those, um, <clears throat> you know, one of those gizmos. Uh, uh, so it was a very electronic sounding voice. Uh, after a while, the guy kind of used to. You know, that became Gordon's voice. As a matter of fact, uh, I guess uh, a little bit more than a week ago, he left a message on my machine just playing around the way he did. It was like, um, um, you know, uh, I'm sure you're not going to know who this is because I'm disguising my voice. You know, that, that was his sense of humor. And, you know, he was in really good spirits. I, you know, I had seen him last Sunday. He was, he was in great spirits. Um, you know, he, he knew time was, was approaching. He didn't know how much time. Um, you know... Gordon was a very complicated person because really after after his wife Smoke died in ninety seven, it could have been very easy for him to throw in the towel. But he didn't, you know, he, he had um um, you know, several children, several grandchildren, great grandchildren. And he really, you know, he, he fought to you know, to, to keep himself together and, and to really get close to his family. And um you know, he really he loved the business, of course, um, um, and helped me quite a bit. Um, even right now, as, as I'm starting to try to put together things here in Florida, he laid a lot of the groundwork for me, um, making some contacts, making some connections, and, and calling in some favors, and doing the things that that he has done, you know, uh, throughout my involvement in the, in the wrestling business. And, and he had very, you know, very very good. Um, uh, uh, his spirits were very good. It just that a couple of months ago, he had started, started getting some blackouts, and uh, that's when he went in and found out that um, the cancer had come back and, and started spreading. And, you know, basically in May he officially retired because he just basically wanted to spend the rest of his time with his family. 
And he, you know, we, we actually, as, as you know, um, found out about uh, this only, as what it seemed like about a week ago Friday, uh, when Steve Kern did the show. Right. And, you know, Gordon wanted it quiet. I mean, aside from the people in, basically in the wrestling community in Tampa, like yourself and Luthez and those type of people, Dory, you know, m people were not really aware of just how serious his condition was until well, well, just the last few days, really. Well, well, Dave, I think the reason for that, Gordon, was, aside from being a very private person, he was really concerned that there would be people out there that might somehow look at a situation like this and try to take advantage of it to their own um, uh, best interest. And, and he really, he wanted to avoid that. He didn't want, you know, Joe Blow coming up with some kind of a Gordon Soli uh, tribute show or, or, or something along those lines, you know, as a fundraiser. Uh, w one of the things, you know, when, when the information got out, um, and, uh, you know, and of course Steve Kern had, had done it strictly by accident, and, and Gordon knew that. And um, when I was over there on Sunday, actually, Gordon was in the pro process of preparing a statement that, that was going to be released. Unfortunately, he had passed before that statement was released. And basically, he just wanted everybody to know is, you know, I'm financially okay. My health is, you know, I'm, I'm, all my health care is taken care of. My state is in line. Um, he, he just had that type of concern. He didn't want anybody going out on the limb for, for him. He didn't want anybody taking advantage of the situation. That's one of the primary reasons he really wants to keep it quiet. Um, you know, when it came out, you know, I had said to him on that Sunday, I said, you know, Gordon, I said, this is going to sound bad. I, I know how quiet you wanted to keep it. I said, maybe it's a good thing because I had seen... You know, I've been very close to Hiro Matsuda, and he also kept it very, very quiet. Um, and, and we kept it just within a very small circle of friends. And by the time it got to the point where, you know, people like, like Hulkster and, and, and Paul Arndorf and, and, and Brian had, had a chance, you know, to see Hiro, he, he was really at his last, it was really at the, uh, at the very end, and they didn't have a chance to hear some of the things that maybe you'd want to hear. In your final in your final days, and I and I think when it got out, and almost as soon as it started getting out, the the reaction of the wrestling fans and people in the wrestling community started you know pouring their heart out to Gordon, you know, uh, you know accolade after accolade, and Gordon really appreciated that hearing that, you know, even though it was for just a couple of days, he really appreciated those those, those sentiments that people were, uh, that had towards him, you know, the the influence that he had on so many people. I guess maybe he didn't realize, and and I think that was a good thing. And again, from a very uh, from a very personal standpoint, I, like I said to Gordon, I said, you know, maybe it's not such a bad thing that it got out, Gordon. You can have a chance to hear some things that that, that Hero never heard, um, you know. And, and uh, I'm just glad that he did hear some of this uh, before he passed on. You know, I mean, he was the one thing you know I was say is is that if you if you're probably between, if I was going to guess, the say the ages of, of 30 to 45, you know, I mean, and you were a wrestling fan, I mean, it's a very important part of your childhood. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, whether, especially, even more so in Florida, but I mean, certainly anywhere anywhere where people had cable. Oh, you know, absolutely, because, Dave. Because, because of the Georgia show. Dave, well, Dave that's, that's very true. And as I mentioned, the first time I ever saw Gordon Soley, I was uh, six years old. And it was a major event for those of us in Georgia and Florida. When I was in college is when the transition happened and Gordon became the host of championship uh, of Georgia Championship Wrestling. It was a major transition for those of us in Georgia because if you lived in South Georgia, you saw both the Florida and the Georgia shows uh, because you had cable that afforded you the chance to see both. And so in the afternoons, you saw Gordon uh, with championship wrestling from Florida. And then at 11 o'clock at night, uh, you had uh, big-time wrestling from Atlanta with Ed Capel. And as I, I know that uh, if people who read The Observer this week are, week are going to read that uh, Ed Capel was a, another wrestling legend that was considered for many years the equal to Gordon. And uh, when Ed made a decision to go with Ann Gunkel's All-South Wrestling in 1973. It was a monumental event for those of us who had followed wrestling all those years that suddenly Gordon was coming up and was going to do both shows, both the Georgia and Florida shows, every week. And uh, it, it was something that 
was a very hard role. Uh, people who, who never saw the uh, Georgia show in the 60s and the 70s uh, in Atlanta don't really realize that filling Ed Capperl's shoes was as tough as filling Gordon Soley's shoes was for Tony Schiavone on the Superstation in 1984, and Schiavone has never been able to fill that role. And truth be told about it, it took a Gordon Foley to be able to have that kind of credibility to succeed Ed Capel in Georgia wrestling in 1973. Had they brought in someone such as they did for a few weeks, a guy from Alabama named Sterling Brewer, who's a good broadcaster, but he was not a strong commentator, or if they had plucked somebody new, or if they had uh, maybe pulled somebody from another area that didn't really understand the circuit or the wrestlers that uh, populated that area, uh, it would not have worked. It would have been a disaster because they would have said he's not Ed Capel. But Gordon was able to come in, and particularly with the fans in South Georgia who knew him from all those years with uh, with uh, Florida wrestling, it was like having an old friend. And then for the people in North Georgia who had never seen Gordon before, uh, it was like finding, well, you know, there's another Ed Capel out there. And so it was it was a major transition at that point, but it was uh, certainly the ideal move that could have been made. You know, Steve, I, I just that, that something something I want to bring up, and I'll, I'll wait till after the break, so when we have a little bit more time about this. But um, Gordon was, I mean, I mean, there's the the thing that happened in '84 when uh, Vince McMahon got control of uh, Channel 17, um, and and all that. It, it, what what came out of of the transition more than anything else was that of all the wrestlers that were wrestling in Georgia in 1984, the person that the fans most associated Georgia Championship Wrestling with was not Tommy Rich or Bob Armstrong. It was Gordon Soley. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, when we come back. I just want, before we before we hit this break, I want to make mention that Daniel Fedak of Surrey, British Columbia, Canada, and Peter McFarland of Middletown, Rhode Island, were our trivia winners today. And since we've got the guy here, uh, we will answer this trivia question. What city did superstar Billy Graham win the WWWF Championship from Bruno San Martino in? Billy. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's he? I, mean, I thought you were talking to the trivia guy. Uh, Baltimore, Maryland, brother. Baltimore, Maryland, in 1977. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up, and I wanted to talk to Steve and and uh, and uh, Ted. We can talk about this in just a, in, in just a few minutes. But first, I want to you know when you brought up the thing in 72, 73, there was a big promotional war in Atlanta, and basically all of the familiar faces of Atlanta wrestling went with Ann Gunkel and All South Wrestling. And the NWA promoters, which was uh, Paul Jones and uh, I think it was it was Buddy Fuller was involved. Uh, yeah, some of those. Les Welch. Uh, Les, Les, Les Welch. Mm-hmm. Les Welch. Okay. So anyway, the um, there was a, there was a huge war between the NWA and the rival All South Wrestling, and I think that when you get right down to it, because of the familiarity of of most of the wrestlers and certainly the announcers that all went with Ann Gunkel, that you you brought that up that a weak announcer. Along with you know, they needed a strong announcer. I mean, they had all of the top talent came into uh, to Georgia. They brought Bill Watts in as Booker, and he brought in a lot of the Florida guys, and they made it a real all-star territory. And Gordon Soley, I think Gordon Soley almost would have had to have been the announcer because I think a weak announcer because of the loyalty to Ed Capral would have you know. It, 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 I'm not saying it was the thing that spelled the difference, but it was it was certainly a key in that wrestling war was getting Gordon Soley up there. Well, you absolutely are right because uh, Ed Capral was the kind who had the talent like Gordon did. He got over wrestlers in many instances who might not otherwise have gotten over because Ed was very much a sportscaster's type deliverer. Uh, he took wrestling very seriously, and Ed left the business in 1977 after uh, working three years with the Crockett's. And uh, he told me he said that uh, he would never leave wrestling critical of the business, even though he didn't like a lot of what happened to it after 1984. He said wrestling made me a very good living. And I'm not going to be one of these people who uh, bites it as I leave. But uh, Ed was Ed was really considered the voice of wrestling. That was his nickname in Atlanta, and he was called in to do a lot of major matches around the country. So when Gordon was brought in, it had to be somebody of that kind of credibility, or the NWA would have never won the wrestling war. Bob Armstrong was the only one of the Paul Jones uh, wrestlers who did not go over with Ann Gunkel. Ed Capel made a very tough decision because he was close to Paul Jones, he was close to Ann Gunkel, but he went with Ann Gunkel because he had been very close to her husband, Ray, 
and he made what was a very tough decision. He said, I never looked back on it. Uh, the fact that the, uh, Ed Capper was very close to Ted Turner and was really responsible for wrestling going to what became the Superstation in 1972 because of his friendship with Ted Turner. But uh, Gordon became the epitome. He's the one who I think really... If you get right down to it and you carry it through those 11 and a half years, a lot of people would argue that Mr. Wrestling Number 2 became the biggest star through all of that era collectively uh, as far as the Superstation was concerned when it went from a local station to a Superstation. But uh, I really believe that the big star, and again, he never exploited that identity, but the big star was really Gordon Soley. Because the day, and, and Ted is very familiar with this, because uh, the, what is considered by a lot of people as the last great match that Gordon Soley called of that uh, Superstation era, the original Superstation era in 1984, was a match between Ted DiBiase and Mr. R, who was, it was a bait and switch thing, it was not Tommy Rich who had been wrestling as that, it turned out to be Brad Armstrong. And uh, Brad was unmasked at the end of the match, but uh, uh, Ted put him over, and Brad became the national heavyweight champion. And it was considered to be a great match, not only because the two guys in the ring were fantastic, but Gordon made a fabulous call of that match and managed to get over a 21-year-old kid with credibility to be a, quote, national champion. And, and so when you had the Black Saturday in 1984, when suddenly it became Freddie Miller in the Atlanta studio... Uh, calling the action of taped matches of Vince McMahon, uh, the fans were furious because Gordon wasn't there. Gordon was the thread that they expected to be there no matter what wrestlers came and went. You know, I, 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 when that happened, there was a tremendous fear in, in 84 when Vince McMahon bought Georgia Championship Wrestling, and then for a one-year period he got on the Superstition the very first week. Very few, you know, no wrestling fans knew there was no communication in wrestling like there is today where people were maybe 2% would have known. I mean, we're talking about maybe point oh 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 two percent knew this was the week of the change. And when it happened, I mean, there was a whole nation, millions of people, because that was the number one rated show on cable at the time. And all of a sudden, instead of seeing, you know, Georgia Championship Wrestling, they knew they were seeing WWF Wrestling. And the switchboards were lit up like crazy at TBS. And the person they complained about not being there was not any of the wrestlers. It was it was Gordon Soley, and I want to before we go on, I want to bring in uh, Steve Kern and Brian Blair. And Gordon Soley was a huge part of both of these two men's lives. And uh, I just want to uh, say welcome both of you guys to the show. And um, I want to give uh, Steve, you know, you first, and then Brian a chance to talk a little bit about you know growing up watching Gordon Soley and then performing with Gordon Soley calling your matches. Okay, um, well we're having technical difficulty. Um, Ted, you know why don't you, you know you were involved in Atlanta just about uh, right you know I guess right at that time and. Um, you know, you know when that whole thing went down. Um, you know what? Do, what do you remember about that period? Hello. 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 <laughs> Whoa. If you'd like to make a call, please hang we up having, and try again. We were having major Ted. Hang up and Ted, we were just talking about the, uh, the that period in '84. Um, so anyway, um, you know, oh, everyone's back up. Can we go to Steve Kern then? Okay, I'm I, I'm back in here now. I, would you repeat the can question? You hear me? What were you guys talking about? Yeah, we can hear. We can hear. We can hear both of you guys. We have Steve Kern and we've got Ted Ted DiBiase. And I, I I wanted to go, I guess, to Steve, you know, to talk about, um, you know, let Ted talk. You ask him a question. Can he hear me? Yeah, hey, Steve. How you doing, buddy? All right. Ted's a lot older than I am, so he's. <laughs> <laughs> I knew. I just I knew I couldn't get on the phone too. with Kern without getting some jab, man. I love you, brother. <laughs> Good to hear your voice. Ted, yeah, you like, him, yeah, I heard you ask him a question, so go ahead. Okay, we were just talking about that 1984 period where, um, you know, where the the thing switched, the Channel 17 switched to uh, WWF, and um, you know the the complaints that came in, and there were thousands of them that weekend. You know, the name that was mentioned far more than any other, and more than any wrestler, was Gordon Soley. You know, we want our Gordon, we want Gordon Soley, and we want our wrestlers back. Absolutely, I mean, I mean, Gordon Soley in the in the minds of the people, and and. Uh, and just about everybody else, you know, uh, he was Georgia Championship Wrestling. He was the he was the man. I mean, uh, more than anybody else, he was there from the very beginning. And uh, uh, I remember that. I remember it quite well. You know, I mean, I, and I was one of those guys in the dressing room when uh, when uh, basically the New York gang w walked in on a Saturday morning and said, "Hey guys, uh, don't don't get excited. Don't go anywhere." 
everybody's got a job, but we're taking over. And uh, there were not a lot of happy people, including myself, because at the time, you know, it was kind of like, you know, I remember Pat, I spoke to Pat Patterson. I said, Pat, I said, you're telling me I've got a job. I said, there's a lot of difference between having a position and having a job. And I said, uh, you know, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not real smart, but I wasn't born yesterday. And I, you know, when you come in to take over, you pretty much got your guns loaded. Uh, you know what talent you're going to go with. So uh, I was one that didn't just didn't hang around. It was at that point that I, you know, I went. Um, well, I went with Ole for a little while, and then I left Georgia and I went back to Bill Watts in Mid South, and then eventually, you know, when. When the time when uh, the first run of uh, WWF stars, when Hulk Hogan and WrestleMania first started taking off, you know, 84, three years later, after WrestleMania three, is when uh, I finally made the move to go to go with Vince. By that time, that first run of guys that had had kind of had that run, and it was time then to bring in some some fresh faces, and it was it was perfect timing. Steve, you know, you, we were going to bring up, and also Brian, who's back on the line. You know, both of you guys grew up in, in the Tampa area, so you grew up watching Gordon Soley, and then uh, basically most of your careers, um, you know, were called, um, a majority of your career, anyway, in both cases, were called by Gordon Soley. And Brian, I know you were very, very close to him, and Steve, you were as well. Uh, Steve, I just want you know, to, to talk about, you know, you know, just your thoughts about Gordon and everything. You got Brian on the line, too? Yeah, Brian's on the line, Steve. too. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, Steve, yeah. And, Brian, I can hear you, oh, too. Was okay, good. How you doing, Dave? Man, I'm doing I really good. my older brothers on the line at the same time. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait. Is, this, is, this, is this the old man, Steve Kern? Hey, <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> These oh, guys are the reason that I'm in the right group of the story. Today, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, what, getting back to Gordon, you know, the whole thing about Gordon Soley was is it was an ego thing. He didn't fill his ego with all these visions of grandeur, he made these stars important, and that's what it was all about. You know, I learned a long time ago that you don't butter up the promotion, you butter, butter up the announcer, because if that's the guy that's making you or breaking you, so if you talk to him nice, and if you're not, um, complimentary to him and what he's doing and how hard a hard job he has out there, then you usually got a lot more from him, but Gordon Soley was never selling Gordon Soley on the air. He was doing his job, and that's what he knew it as, his job. And Brian and I had the fortune of being with him the last few times, you know, at lunches and stuff, and and, and it was so, it was simple there. Brian, um, Wade Boggs was asking him because Wade Boggs had just done some commentary. You know, what is it that I need to do? And Gordon Soley told him right there, he says, you need to get the action over and those guys that are playing the game over. That's the whole thing that people are listening for. They're not listening for the commentators to make themselves. They're listening for the commentators to describe what's going on and make the stars bigger than life. Well, <clears throat> you know, I, um, I haven't really heard the whole program, excuse me, because I just kind of got back in. I've been helping the family along with Dottie Curtis uh, with the funeral arrangements, and uh, I just caught what Steve said, and I, I can appreciate that very much. Um, uh, I'd like to mention Dottie Curtis. She's been just such a big help to the family, and I just nailed down the church and in uh, the time and everything. It's not even publicized yet, but I'll give it to you, Dave, uh, and to the fans that want to come, because it is a public uh, memorial. And uh, we can do that in, in a couple minutes. You can ask me that when you're ready. But um, I'd like to expound upon the lunches. You know, I was very privileged, and I don't want to step on what was already said, and I know what I'm going to say uh, nobody else could possibly say because uh, I was very uh, fortunate in being able to share the last year of Gordon's life. We started, uh, I called him up, and we went out to lunch uh, before he had his was going to have his surgery and had a couple of great times, and he never stopped smoking those cigarettes that he enjoyed so much. But uh um, anyway, we went out to uh, to uh, lunch, and uh, he finally had the operation. And of course, his wife uh, Smoke had died in 1997. And uh, Gordon, just uh, uh, the man uh, that we all know, uh, of course, was uh, he had a soft side to him. And he loved his wife so dearly. I mean, that was his life. Uh, his uh, once Smoke passed away, Gordon just kind of lost the deal after '97, and. Um, he had a, a a pillow in his house. Uh, when you'd walk in his house, it said "Screw the Golden Year." <laughs> it was really funny. And uh, mm -hmm. anyway, uh, after uh, we went out to to uh, 
<clears throat> lunch a few times. He had his operation. We started up again, and uh, um, uh, then he uh, started talking uh, with uh, the little thing, the little uh, aspirator, whatever you call that thing, uh, refrigerator, some kind of gimmick. But uh, uh, Gordon um, uh, loved the lunches that we had in the first uh we had some, and then uh, uh, Rocky Rocky Johnson joined us, and uh, it was always Jack Briscoe who was my childhood hero. And it wasn't it wasn't for Gordon uh, getting him over. Uh, you know, I I'm uh, I'm not sure that uh, that uh, I would have thought as much about him as I did then, and uh, even more so today. Jack's um, one of my greatest friends, along with Ernie. And, and um, uh, then Steve started coming to lunch with us. And, um, anyway, be. Uh, Gordon uh, decided that he wanted to have a, a party. A couple of quick things. Uh, Gordon, you know, we all decided, well, let's have a living party after Gordon found out that uh, he didn't have a long time to live. And, um, you know, he, he didn't want it to be front page news. So we kind of kept it quiet. And we uh, had Gordon, I'm actually looking at uh, the invitation right here. Um, we had a, a few people help us um, uh, get uh, names and addresses together. Uh, Howard Brody. Um, was great and uh, Mark Nolte was uh, helping out a little bit there and Dottie was uh, awesome and anyway we were getting this big party together for Gordon and about about five weeks out um, uh, Gordon said that um, uh, you know we wanted to make sure that everybody we could mail them where everybody received their invitation uh, to the party that was uh, going to be at the Sheraton Four Points Hotel here in Tampa they received their invitation to the party you know in ample time to get time off and to be able to get a little discount on their ticket if they were going to pay for their own ticket. So right before we were going to send this uh, ticket off, uh, I mean the uh, invitations off, uh, Gordon says, you know, uh, he says this to Jack Briscoe, it was just Gordon. Jack and I at lunch at this particular time, he said, you know, um, uh, I've just got a funny feeling about this and um, um, I just think we better hold the party off. And, uh, it's uh, really strange that the party just happened to be this Saturday, August 5th, and this is the day where he's actually going to have his funeral service memorial. That's one irony. And um, um, the second, uh, another thing I'd like to say is Steve was mentioning, you know, he was really funny because Gordon was a big fan of Wade Boggs, and, and Wade's a friend of Steve's. Steve actually introduced me to Wade, and um, uh I've grown to really enjoy his company, and he's a, he's a wonderful guy. And, and Gordon, I didn't know, was a huge fan of Wade Boggs. So um, another friend of ours uh, was uh, ran into uh, Wade, and he asked, hey, what's Brian doing? Well, he's going out with uh, Gordon and Jack to lunch. You mean Gordon? Gordon Soley? Gordon Soley? I mean, Wade Boggs was such a fan of Gordon Soley and Jack Briscoe also. But he was just such a fan, he couldn't believe it. He said, is there any way you can get me into lunch with and uh, so he called and we set it up, and uh, it, it so happened uh, that day, and Steve can testify to this, uh, Gordon Soley uh, uh, signed his last autographed picture to Wade Boggs, and uh, Wade, of course, signed uh, Gordon one and Jack, and uh, it, it was a really, really nice happening there, um, as uh, Steve can attest to. And then, you know, since I've got my buddy Ted DiBiase on the line, are you there, Ted? Yeah, I'm here, brother. Um, you know, it was really cool because uh, I wanted to say this to you um, and, and to really to the whole world. But um, you know, Gordon, um, as far you know, as far as uh, religion, Gordon, you know, he wasn't an atheist, but uh, not at all. But he wasn't sure where he was going. And uh, we'd come in from the lunches, and <laughs> the last few times that we had our lunches, um, I'd uh, sit down. Yeah, and you've got to understand this now. You, you're seeing a, a your hero. Um, suffering with this cancer and, and he could have lived he, he's such a, a man to me because he could have lived for another five years three to five years they said uh, if he would have taken the cancer treatment and he just decided that uh, he didn't want to do that so um, uh, he uh, the last few times we went to lunch you know I, I asked Gordon I said do you mind if I uh, when I took him I'd sit him in his chair and I said uh, Gordon do you mind if I say a prayer with you and he said no go ahead this was the first time so I, I held his hand, got on my knee, said a little prayer, and um, um, after we said the prayer, he looked at me, said thank you, smiled, and I left. Second time, same thing. Well, this last time that uh, 
Steve Kern and uh, myself and uh, Jack, uh, Jack Briscoe, I shouldn't say myself, but Jack Briscoe, uh, um, we're up at lunch uh, <coughs> with uh, him and uh, Wade. Um, uh, we uh, got back home to Gordon's house. Uh, this was just, uh, uh, just uh, that was on um, July 13th, back, and we were in the Loop Mello room there. At Malio's, came back to Gordon's house. Uh, Jack sat in the car. I took uh, Gordon inside, sat him down, and I kneeled down with him, and I said a prayer with him, and I just said, you know, if, it, if it's in, you know, if it's in uh, your will, God, please, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> understand and lead him into, um, uh, you know, uh, where we want him to be, uh, where he wants to be, and anyway, to make a, a long story short, he looked at me in the eyes, and uh, you know, he he said, Brian, you know, I, I really realize your sincerity, and that meant very, very much to me. Oh, I finally, and, and I believe you, and. I had sent him a fax because I had just got back from Alaska because we were supposed to set up a lunch this week with uh, Buddy Colt and Stu Schwartz. And uh, um, I think also uh, Dottie and Don were going to come this week also. And uh, possibly Lufez, and, who had joined us at a previous lunch, which was a great time. But uh, Brian, Brian I, I hate to interrupt you, especially like through this, but we're like totally out of time. Brian, real quick, why don't you tell everyone about the, the funeral services because we, we actually have to run now. Okay, the funeral services are at the First Baptist Church, but I'm not going to tell you any more than that. Let's, let's, let me say my final line. Go ahead. Okay, final line was uh, the, there was a thing attached to uh, the facts that I sent him that said, I'm with the Lord now. And I just wanted to tell uh, Teddy and every other believer out there, amen. The funeral services will be at the First Baptist Church at 302, 302 West Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida. Uh, the zip code is 33606. Dave, you've got my phone number. If you need anything else, please call me. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. I want to thank Dory Funk Jr., Jack Briscoe, Rick Flair, Ted DiBiase, Gordon Soley, Steve Bever I mean Gordon Soley, Bill Superstar, Billy Graham, Steve Beverly, and Brian Alvarez, Steve Kern, um, all for this tribute to Gordon Soley, and I hope that you all enjoyed, and we'll have a regular show uh, uh, tomorrow at 6.